Lab number one is a review of the oscilloscope, function generator, and digital multimeter that we used in ECE 303. The oscilloscope is also an infinium, but it's a wider bandwidth version. As you recall, the oscilloscope is an instrument that can display voltage versus time. The scope that we are using in lab is a two-channel digital storage scope. And by two-channel, we mean that we can observe two different voltages at the same time. Digital storage means that the voltage that is measured is converted to a series of binary numbers, which are then stored in memory and then converted for a monitor to display. The picture below is a screen capture of a 6 volt, 1000 hertz sine wave. The symbol here, the little ground symbol, indicates the zero volt reference. And so we have one division, two divisions, three divisions above ground. And the number of volts per division is shown right here as two volts per division. So that gives us six volts. In terms of a period, we have one, two, three, four, five divisions. And each is 200 microseconds. So that's going to give us 1,000 microseconds, which is one millisecond. And the reciprocal of that would be one kilohertz. So indeed, we do have a six volt sine wave, two cycles displayed on the screen. As we used in 303, we're using passive components. And of course, one of those is a resistor. And the resistors we're going to be using in the lab, for the most part, have a color code. And the colors are shown here of black through white, where each color indicates a specific numerical value. And then lastly, there is a band, which will indicate a tolerance. Now bands 1, 2, and 3, with the colors shown, tell you the value of the resistor on the average. These are really placeholders. So here's band 1, band 2, and band 3. Let's do an example. Suppose that we take a red, violet, yellow, gold resistor and try to figure out its value and then its range of values. Look up above, red is 2, violet is 7, and yellow is 4. And so that would be 270,000 ohms, the gold being a 5% tolerance. So the resistor could be anywhere between 5% above 270K or 5% below 270K. And that corresponds to 256.5K to 283.5K. In lab, we have a fairly accurate multimeter that can measure resistance. It has two different modes. One's called a two-wire measurement mode. And the picture below here kind of indicates what's happening in terms of the instrument. We hook up a wire from the high and low connections. Say one's red and one's black. And we hook up our unknown resistor. Let's call it R sub U. The instrument forces a current to pass through the wires in the sample and come back. And then it measures the voltage across these terminals and then takes the ratio of those two. And that's what it displays on the screen. But let's, let's try a schematic of what we're seeing here. So we have a current source back at the terminals of the multimeter and an unknown sample that we've connected a wire to and a wire back to. So if you consider the fact that the wire is an ideal and it does have some resistance per foot. We could indicate that as R of the red wire and R of the black wire. So the rise in voltage here V would equal the current that's flowing in this loop, which is the current source I, times the resistance of the red wire, the resistance of the unknown sample, and then the resistance of the black wire. The I is common, and so what we're really measuring is the resistance of our sample plus the wires. And the wire resistance depends on thickness and length, but for most of our wires in lab, we're looking at something between 50 milliohms and 500 milliohms. So if we're measuring something that's 1,000 ohms, uh, this is really pretty small, and so we could ignore 
the effects of the wires. But what if we were measuring some low resistance? Is there some way to take this into account? Well, we could measure the wire resistance and then subtract it, or we can use another mode of the meter called four-wire measurement. Here a second pair of wires is brought out to actually measure the voltage across the sample. Now a voltmeter ideally has an infinite resistance, but many digital meters have input resistances on the order of tens of hundreds of megaohms. So in reality now we're measuring the voltage across the sample and we're forcing a known current through the sample and so the ratio of this voltage to this current is the value of the unknown resistance. Our Fluke Digital Multimeter has five, actually six places that are displayed. One is called a half digit because it isn't able to go through the full range of numbers. So five of the digits uh, can go from zero to nine and then this leading one is either a zero or a one. They call it a half digit in the sense of a binary case of just two values. When we do read something on the screen, there is a window of accuracy, just like there's a tolerance to the resistance. So let's take a look at some numbers here. On the 20 k ohm range of the multimeter, the accuracy is listed by Fluke as 0.0028% of whatever your reading is plus two digits. Okay, what does that mean? Suppose that I read 13.3413 k ohms. Okay, we take the reading and multiply it by the percent, which is going to be an additional two zeros here, plus the two that were up here in 28. And when you multiply that times the reading, you get something, and of course the reading was in k ohms. Now, if you take the places that are here, and you can have up to nine digits here, and then keep on going, but they're saying that there's a two-digit error, so we just take all the places that are here, put all zeros in them except the last one, and put a two. If there was nine digits, we put a nine here. If there were 30 digits, we put a three-zero here. This is really the quantization error of digitizing the signal. But you gotta keep the unit. So this was k-ohms, and so we're gonna put that also here with just two digits. Add the two together, and that's really the window of accuracy that you have. In other words, if you take the reading and subtract and add this very long number here with lots of digits and places, that becomes the window of accuracy of your reading. So in reality, what we read is somewhere between this value and this value. But if you look at the reading, it was 13.3413. And both of these, the first four places, are identical. And then the fifth place is very closely the same, but we could say that at least those four places are uh, representative of our actual value. Let me back up here a little bit to the first reading here. If you had a lot of leading zeros here, you'd have a lot more zeros here. And this ultimately becomes the minimum error. So the trick is to have as, as many digits here as possible without leading zeros. And if you put it in the auto scale, it'll try to do that for you. I'm going to practice another example. I worked another one out here, but didn't show the work. Took this as a reading and assume it has the same accuracy. And then this is what I calculated as the range of values. We want to try that just to see if you got the ideas down for the accuracy of our multimeter. In lab, we'll also take a look at the accuracy of the oscilloscope screen. Most instruments have different ways of expressing these types of errors, and this is just according to the manufacturer's manual. In 303 lab, the wires and connectors that we used had a variety of bandwidths. We're going to use BNC type connectors in everything we do, actually, except DC power supplies. And when you interconnect these two pieces of the BNC cables, you create a shield that is continuous in the sense that the wire itself has a sleeve around it that's actually a braided metal and it forms a, like a cage and then the, some type of a dielectric and then the actual wire itself. So this outer shield is our ground and the inner wire gives us our two connections. These type of connectors can go into the many gigahertz range. We also use banana wires and banana to grabber wires 
mostly used for low frequency uh, audio connect connections or DC. Sometimes we need to have a little alligator clip to connect on that can slip on the end of this or you can just use the grabber itself. We don't have to worry about the, the oxidation on the tips here because that does give you some more resistance. So sometimes kind of rubbing those or trying to clean them a little bit does help. Lastly, we're going to use our oscilloscope probe to take quite a few measurements. This is a little different than the probe we currently use in the 303 lab. This has a much higher bandwidth capabilities. Our oscilloscope has a usable frequency of 1 gigahertz. The 303 oscilloscope has a usable bandwidth of 500 megahertz. The probe is very similar. In the tip, there's really a 9 megaohm resistor and a 9 picofarad capacitor. The cable itself has some capacitance per foot. And then at the interface to the scope, there's a little set screw that you can vary the capacitance. And then what's in parallel here is this capacitance, this capacitance, and then the capacitance of the scope, which is around 8 picofarads. In the 303 lab, we had looked at calculating a balanced bridge. Basically, we have a resistive voltage divider and a capacitive voltage divider. And when they're balanced, whatever's coming in here will show up on the face of the screen. That's when the capacitive voltage divider equals the resistive voltage divider. This is a test signal from our oscilloscope. If they're not matched properly, if the capacitive voltage divider is greater than the resistive voltage divider, on the rising edge, we get a larger signal because that divider is bigger than this one, which represents a resistive voltage divider if you wait long enough. Capacitors become open circuits when you reach steady state. So here you got a transient response, a lot of current flowing through the capacitive voltage divider, and then eventually the resistive voltage divider. If you have the resistive voltage divider larger than the capacitive voltage divider, then on the rising edge, again, we'll get a division, but it won't be as big as what we get from the resistive divider. So we'll get these rounded edges, which you call undercompensated and then overcompensated. And this is really an artifact of the instrument and not the test signal, or what you're trying to measure in your circuit. So you have to be very careful that you balance the probes every time you use the scope. And we've done this in the 303 lab. This particular lab has two things. It has concepts covered and laboratory techniques. What we just talked about and we'll look at in this lab is a review of the oscilloscope, the function generator, and the digital multimeter. We looked at here and we'll look at in the lab equivalent circuits of the oscilloscope inputs, the function generator, and the digital multimeter. We also looked at using a balanced bridge to compensate for stray capacitance of our measuring cable and our equivalent input of the oscilloscope. Then lastly, the concept of accuracy of our components and instruments was reviewed. In lab, we'll learn and revisit the measurement of voltage and time with an oscilloscope, how to compensate a probe, and measuring resistance, including small values. And this will be our first lab in ECE 402.